Welcome to Color Me Green, a podcast focused on making the world a greener place. I don't have much to update on, so we're just going to get straight into the episode. Like the majority of these episodes, a lot of the time I see a little article or something on Google and I find it intriguing enough to want to research and look more into it. Today is one of those times. I found something once discussing how there was a lot of trash buildup on Mount Everest, and I found that very odd to imagine. When you think of Mount Everest, well, at least when I think of a place that's hard to climb, you probably wouldn't take much with you because traveling light is probably your best bet. And I also wouldn't think that that many people go there, at least enough to trash up the place, but apparently I am very wrong in all of those assumptions. I'm also not a climber, so this really isn't my forte, but I'm still wrong in all of my assumptions, apparently. This episode is also going to have a lot of hard names to pronounce, so just apologizing right here and now for any mispronunciations of the many things I'm going to have to struggle to pronounce. Mount Everest is a peak in the Himalayan mountain range. It is located between Nepal and Tibet, an autonomous region of China. At 29,032 feet, it is considered the tallest point on Earth. In 1841, Sir George Everest, a surveyor of India, recorded Everest's location, labeling it Peak 15. Later in 1859, Peak 15 was renamed to Mount Everest. Just to get a better idea of the expeditions to Everest, we are going to discuss a few of the early expeditions, and then move into the more recent ones. I really like doing episodes like this where I can go off into the history of things, especially things like these expeditions where we might think we know a little information about it, but to learn what it's really like and delve deeper into them before discussing how people are ruining the things we learned about. In the 1890s, two British Army officers stationed in India, Sir Francis Younghusband and Charles Bruce, met and began discussing the idea of an expedition to Mount Everest. They collaborated with two British exploring organizations, the Royal Geographical Society, RGS, and the Alpine Club, which played a key role in generating interest in exploring the mountain. However, attempts to obtain permission for an Everest expedition in the early 1900s were halted by political tensions and bureaucratic challenges. In 1913, British officer John Knoll managed to enter Tibet, even though it was closed to Westerners. He came within 40 miles of Everest and gave a lecture to the RGS in 1919, reigniting interest in the mountain. Subsequently, permission to explore Everest was granted by Tibet in 1920. The RGS and the Alpine Club then formed the Mount Everest Committee to organize and fund the expedition. Under the leadership of Lieutenant Colonel C.K. Howard Burry, a team set out in 1921 to explore the Himalayan range and find a route up Everest. The team members included G.H. Bullock, A.M. Callis, George Mallory, H. Rayburn, A.F.R. Wollaston, and surveyors Majors H.T. Morrishead and O.E. Wheeler, as well as geologist A.M. Heron. Why none of these people went by their actual names and just initials is odd to me. I don't know if that's just the way they're listed, but like, was that normal back then or am I just right in thinking that that's weird? During the summer of 1912, the team extensively explored the northern approaches to the mountain. Unfortunately, Callis passed away due to heart failure and Rayburn fell ill, leaving Mallory and Bullock to conduct most of the high exploration work. Lacking experience in the Himalayas, they faced acclimatization challenges along with difficult terrain. Their initial objective was to explore the Rongbuk Valley, not sure if that's how you say it, while ascending the central Rongbuk Glacier. They missed the narrower opening of the eastern branch and a possible route up to Everest. After a rest at Karda Sikar, they discovered a pass at 22,000 feet called Lagba, which led to the head of the east Rongbuk Glacier. On September 24th, Mallory Bullock and Wheeler successfully climbed the forbidding looking saddle north of Everest, which they named the North Coal. Although strong winds prevented them from going further, Mallory had from there traced a potential route to the summit. 
In the attempt of 1922, a mountain expedition led by Brigadier General C.G. Bruce took place. Members of the expedition included Captain J.G. Bruce, C.J. Crawford, G.I. Finch, T.G. Longstaff, Mallory, Captain C.J. Morris, Major Moorhead, Edward Norton, T.H. Somerville, Colonel E.I. Strutt, A.W. Wakefield, and John Knoll. The team decided to attempt the mountain before the summer monsoon, and during the spring, Sherpas carried their baggage across the windy plateau of Tibet. I just want to make a note right now, just in case anyone is as uneducated as I apparently am or was prior to researching and learning, educating myself, a Sherpa is 100% not a form of llama or alpaca. And I laugh at myself for thinking this now. A Sherpa is a member of the Himalayan people living on the borders of Nepal and Tibet, renowned for their skill in mountaineering. I 100% thought that these people were taking alpacas up the mountains with them, which just doesn't make sense to me now that I think about it. Supplies were transported from base camp at 16,500 feet to an advanced base at Camp 3. On May 13th, they established a camp on the North Col, and with great difficulty, they set up a higher camp at 25,000 feet, on the sheltered side of the North Ridge. On May 21st, Mallory, Norton, and Somerville continued the ascent, leaving Moore's head behind due to frostbite. They reached 27,000 feet near the crest of the Northeast Ridge. On May 25th, Finch and Captain Bruce, using oxygen, set out for Camp 3. Finch's belief in using oxygen proved justified as they established Camp 5 at 25,500 feet. After being stormbound for a day and two nights, Finch and Bruce reached 27,300 feet and returned to Camp 3 on the same day. A third attempt during the early monsoon snow resulted in disaster. On June 7th, while crossing the North Coal Slopes, Mallory, Crawford, and Somerville, accompanied by 14 Sherpas, faced an avalanche. Unfortunately, nine Sherpas were swept off over an ice cliff, and seven lost their lives. Mallory's party was carried down 150 feet, but escaped without injury. The expedition attempt of 1924 was led by Brigadier General Bruce, and included several members such as Bentley Beetham, Captain Bruce, J.D. V. Hazard, Major R.W.G. Hingston, Andrew Irvine, Mallory Norton, Noel O'Dell, E.O. Shabir, Somerville, and Noel. Noel came up with a unique way to fund the trip by purchasing all film and lecture rights for the expedition, which covered the entire cost. To attract interest in the climb, he created a commemorative postcard and stamp sending them from base camp, mainly to school children who had requested them. This marked the beginning of many Everest public relations efforts. During the climb, they faced wintry conditions, and Camp 4 on the North Coal was established on May 22nd using a new and steeper yet safer route. However, they had to descend due to the challenging conditions. General Bruce had to leave because of illness, but under Norton's leadership, Camp 4 was re-established on June 1st. At 25,000 feet, Mallory and Captain Bruce were forced to stop when their Sherpas became exhausted. On June 4th, Norton and Somerville, accompanied by three Sherpas, established Camp 6 at 26,800 feet and reached 28,000 feet the next day. Norton reached a documented height of 28,100 feet, a record that remained unsurpassed until 1953. Mallory and Irvine, using oxygen, started their summit attempt on June 6th from the North Coal. On June 8th, they began their ascent towards the summit. Odell, who had climbed up that morning, believed he spotted them high up between the mists. Initially, Odell claimed to have seen them at what later became known as the second step, though some have argued it might have been the third step. These are steep rock barriers on the northwest ridge, making the final approach difficult. Odell saw them at about 12.50 p.m., about 500 feet below the summit, but uncertainty and debate have persisted about whether they actually made it to the top and their direction of travel when seen by Odell. The next morning, Odell searched for them at Camp 6, but found no trace. Mallory's response to why he wanted to climb Everest 
because it's there, became famous. His disappearance after three expeditions shocked the British public, and for 75 years, his fate remained a mystery. In 1933, a series of airplane flights were conducted over Everest, the first occurring on April 3rd, which permitted the summit and surrounding landscape to be photographed. In 1934, Maurice Wilson, an inexperienced climber who was obsessed with the mountain, died over Camp 3 after attempting to climb alone. During the reconnaissance of 1935, Wilson's body was found and buried. Moving forward 20 years, we have the historical ascent of 1953. The expedition team, sponsored by the Royal Geographical Society and the Alpine Club, consisted of several members, including the leader Colonel John Hunt, later known as Baron Hunt, G.C. Band, Bordillion, R.C. Evans, A. Gregory, Edmund Hillary, W.G. Lowe, C.W.F. Noyce, M.P. Ward, M.H. Westmacott, Major C.G. Wiley, T. Stobart, the team cinematographer, and LGC Pugh, the team physiologist. After undergoing three weeks of training on nearby mountains, they devised a route up the Kumbu Icefall and began transporting supplies to the Western Quim Head. I don't know if this word actually says Quim, but it's literally spelled C-W-M, and if that doesn't say Quim, I don't know what does. So that's just what I'm going to call it, okay? Even if I'm wrong, it's Quim from here on out. During the preparations, Lowe spent nine days working on the lower section of the Lotsey face, and a camp was set up at 24,000 feet on May 17th. Noyce and Analu Sherpa successfully created a route on the upper part of the face on May 21st. The following day, a group of Sherpas led by Wiley with Hillary and Tenzing reached the coal and deposited supplies. Despite facing high winds, the expedition continued making progress. On May 24th, the first summit party, accompanied by Hunt and two Sherpas, reached the coal. On May 26th, Evans and Bodillon reached the south summit of Everest, but time constraints prevented them from going further. Simultaneously, Hunt and Denam Gaval Sherpa left supplies for a bridge camp at 27,350 feet. On May 28th, Hillary, Tenzing, Lo, Gregory, and Aang Nima established the ridge camp at 27,900 feet and spent the night there. The next morning on May 29th, Hillary and Tenzing began their ascent and reached the south summit by 9 a.m. The final section of this summit presented challenges, including Hillary Step, a steep spur of rock and ice. Without the aid of fixed ropes, Hillary and Tenzing carefully climbed it, and at 11.30 a.m., they stood on the summit of Everest. They spent about 15 minutes up there taking photos and looking for signs of previous climbers. After their successful summit, they made their way back down to the South Coal, where they were met by Lowe and Noyce. By June 2nd, the entire expedition had regrouped at the base camp. The news of their triumph was spread worldwide and garnered significant attention and celebration, particularly in Britain and the Commonwealth. Hillary and Hunt were knighted, and Tenzing was awarded the George Medal. The entire team was honored and celebrated for their historic achievement. During the 1950s and 60s, organizing an Everest expedition was prohibitively expensive, and there were only a few climbers familiar with the Himalayas, resulting in many years without attempts on the mountain. By the 1970s, expeditions became more frequent, but Nepal still issued only a few permits each year. In the 1980s, permits became available for both pre- and post-monsoon seasons, and for routes via China and Nepal, leading to a total of around 10 expeditions per year. In the 90s, at least 10 expeditions occurred each season on each side of the mountain, and this trend continued after 2000. One of the most successful operators, Rob Hall from New Zealand, had previously led teams to the summit on multiple occasions. However, tragedy struck on May 1996 when his group, along with several other teams, was caught in a severe afternoon storm at the summit. Hall and his client, Doug Hansen, lost their lives at the South Summit. Another American guide, Scott Fisher, and several climbers, including three Indians on the northeastern ridge, also lost their lives. While earlier deaths in the 1980s received little attention, 
the 1996 storm deaths were instantly reported over the internet and gained massive media coverage and attention. Despite this disaster, the allure of Everest remained undiminished. In spite of the clear message that no guide can ensure climbers' safety at high altitudes, commercial traffic on Everest significantly increased over time. The number of climbers successfully reaching the summit rose continuously after 2000, peaking at around 630 in 2007 and surpassing 800 in 2018. The surge in climbers led to multiple expeditions operating simultaneously on the mountain, with dozens reaching the summit on the same day. For instance, on May 23, 2001, almost 90 climbers accomplished this feat, and in subsequent years, similar daily totals were common during the peak May climbing season. The record was set on May 19, 2012, when an unprecedented 234 climbers made it to the top. However, the large crowds of climbers caused bottlenecks in some narrow sections of the mountain. One significant incident occurred on May 19, 2012, when a dangerous backup of climbers occurred at the Hillary Step, resulting in the death of four people. This prompted expedition leaders to improve coordination for their final ascent attempts. Despite these efforts, overcrowding remained an issue, leading to a deadly season in 2019, during which long lines in mid-May prevented several climbers from ascending and descending quickly enough to replenish their oxygen supply. Tragically, 11 climbers lost their lives that season. Despite a record number of ascents, with as many as 885 reaching the summit. Wow. Just imagine finally getting to the top, and then you don't even make it back down to live with that accomplishment. I'm sure they do, but they should have some sort of like, I don't know, rules of patrol or a barrier when you have to like pay to get in or only so many allowed at this time, kind of like a museum or a national park or something like that. Next, I want to go quickly into the different routes and techniques so we can better understand the mountain and how it's ascended. And then we will get into discussing the human challenges and then move into the environmental portion. The most commonly chosen route for climbers attempting to reach the summit of Mount Everest is the southern route, which goes through the Kambu Icefall and the South Coal. This was the same route taken by the 1953 British expedition led by Edmund Hillary and Sherpa Tenzing Norgay, who, as we discussed, became the first to successfully reach the summit. On the other hand, the northern route, which was attempted by seven British expeditions in the 20s and 30s without success, has also been climbed. The first successful ascent via the northern route was made by a Chinese expedition in 1960. Early climbers on Everest, many of whom had military backgrounds, adopted a method called siege climbing. This involves a large team establishing a series of tented camps progressively higher up the mountainside. This approach allows climbers to acclimatize to the high altitude by climbing higher during the day and sleeping at lower camps at night. Camps are set up at regular intervals along the route, each designated as Camp 1, Camp 2, and so on, with the final camp located a few thousand feet below the summit, from where a small assault team attempts the final ascent. Originally, there was a belief among some climbers that using oxygen, relying on Sherpa support, and climbing in large groups was unsporting and went against the essence of mountain climbing. However, in the 70s, top mountaineers began adopting a more traditional alpine style of climbing, which involved smaller parties moving swiftly with all their gear and provisions. This lightweight approach avoids the need for extensive safety ropes and heavy oxygen tanks emphasizing speed and efficiency. Despite this approach, climbers still need to spend around four weeks acclimatizing at base camp before attempting a summit bid. Everest presents significant challenges for climbers despite notable advancements in equipment, transportation, communications, and weather forecasting since the early expeditions in the 1920s. The mountain's remote location adds to the difficulty, with no roads on the Nepal side, requiring goods and supplies to be manually transported over long distances. However, the introduction of airstrips in the Kumbu Valley has improved accessibility to the Everest vicinity, though higher areas still rely on footpaths. 
On the Tibet side, there is now a road leading to the north side of base camp. The weather conditions on Everest allow only two brief windows for a successful ascent. The best time is in April and May, just before the monsoon season, and as the snow becomes too soft and the risk of avalanches increases during the monsoon. Another possible window is in September after the monsoon, but climbing becomes nearly impossible from October to March due to severe winter storms. In addition to the location and climate challenges, high altitudes have a severe impact on the human body. Above approximately 25,000 feet in the Himalayas, the death zone, climbers experience extreme effects of oxygen deprivation known as hypoxia. This leads to rapid breathing and pulse rates as the body tries to compensate for the lack of oxygen. Climbers also struggle with digestion, sleep problems, and confused thinking. The use of supplemental oxygen can help mitigate the effects of hypoxia, but it can also become problematic if climbers become dependent on it and run out at high altitudes. High altitude cerebral edema, known as HACE, and high altitude pulmonary edema, known as HAPE, are two medical conditions that can affect climbers at high elevations. HACE occurs when the brain swells due to the increased blood flow as a response to oxygen deficiency. HAPE, on the other hand, involves blood leaking into the lung's air sacs, essentially causing drowning. The most effective treatment for both conditions is to move the affected person to a lower elevation. In emergencies, the drug dexamethasone has proven useful in restoring movement to incapacitated climbers, allowing them to descend safely. Other challenges are obviously frostbite, which can happen if proper attire and gear is not used. Then there's also earthquakes and avalanches. Over the years, significant advancements in climbing gear, equipment, technology, including mobile wireless availability on the mountain, and expedition planning have greatly enhanced the safety of those attempting to climb Everest. Despite these improvements, the region remains an extremely perilous place where tragedy can strike unexpectedly. The two notable incidents occurred almost a year apart. On April 18, 2014, a devastating avalanche hit a group of Sherpas who were carrying supplies through the Kumbu Icefall, resulting in the loss of 16 lives. 13 confirmed deaths, three presumed missing and dead. This incident marked the deadliest single day in Everest climbing history up to that point. Subsequently, on April 25, 2015, a massive earthquake in central Nepal triggered avalanches on Everest, with one of them hitting base camp and causing the death or injury of numerous climbers and workers. The known death toll on the mountain was 19, surpassing the previous year's total. The route through the Kumbu Ice Falls suffered severe damage, leaving dozens of climbers stranded at camps 1 and 2 above the ice fall, necessitating helicopter rescues. I don't know. If you know me, I wouldn't risk my life to do something so dangerous. Sure, people get up and down with no issues, but that's just too much preparation and possible risk for me to think it's worth putting on a bucket list. I'll just enjoy the photos on Google. The early Mount Everest climbers' values differed significantly from the modern approach to environmental responsibility. In the early 20th century, when the first expeditions took place, there was a prevailing attitude of conquest and exploration, often driven by nationalistic motives and personal glory. The environmental impact of these expeditions was not a major concern, and the priority was to reach the summit at any cost. Some of the key differences between early climbers' values and the modern approach include expedition size and scale. Early expeditions were large and resource-intensive, with large teams of climbers, porters, and support staff. This led to significant waste generation and damage to the fragile mountain environment. In contrast, modern expeditions emphasize smaller, self-sufficient teams and reduce their ecological footprint. Waste disposal. Early climbers did not prioritize waste disposal, and the mountainsides and base camps became littered with discarded equipment, food packaging, and human waste. Today, environmental responsibility dictates that climbers must follow strict waste management practices, including carrying all trash back down the mountain and using proper waste disposal methods. 
oxygen, and equipment usage. Early climbers used vast quantities of oxygen bottles and equipment, which were often left behind on the mountain. Modern climbers, while still using supplemental oxygen in some cases, aim to minimize their reliance on it and make efforts to retrieve their equipment after their expedition. This brings up a great time to introduce the leave no trace principles. According to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Leave No Trace is a national education program to inform visitors about reducing the damage caused by outdoor activities, particularly non-motorized recreation. Leave No Trace principles and practices are based on an abiding respect for the natural world and wildland visitors. These principles promote responsible outdoor ethics and practices to minimize human impact on the environment. These are especially crucial in high-sensitive and pristine environments like Mount Everest. The Leave No Trace concept aims to preserve this and many other delicate ecosystems, ensuring the future generations can also experience the mountain's beauty and significance. The core principles include 1. Plan ahead and prepare. Adequate planning helps reduce the overall impact on the environment. Climbers and expedition teams should thoroughly research and understand the rules, regulations, and guidelines set forth by local authorities and conservation organizations. Proper preparation also includes packing the necessary gear and supplies to minimize waste and ensure self-sufficiency during the ascent. Two, travel and camp on durable surfaces. As much as possible, climbers and trekkers should stick to established trails and designated camping areas by avoiding sensitive vegetation and wildlife habitats. The impact on the fragile ecosystem can be minimized. 3. Dispose of waste properly. Waste management is a crucial aspect of Leave No Trace principles. All waste, including human waste, should be carried off the mountain and disposed of responsibly. Expeditions typically use designated waste containers to transport waste back to base camps for proper disposal or recycling. 4. Leave what you find. It's essential to leave the natural features and cultural artifacts undisturbed. Avoid picking flowers, removing rocks, or disturbing any historical sites or landmarks. This ensures the preservation of the mountain's unique beauty and historical significance. 5. Minimize campfire impact. Campfires can have detrimental effects on the delicate alpine environment. It's best to rely on portable stoves for cooking and avoid building campfires except in designated areas where it is allowed and safe. 6. Respect wildlife. Observing wildlife from a distance and not feeding or approaching them helps to maintain their natural behaviors and avoids causing unnecessary stress to the animals. 7. Be considerate of other visitors. Being mindful of other climbers, trekkers, and the local communities is essential to promoting a positive and respectful experience for everyone. Keep noise levels low, respect the privacy of other groups, and follow any cultural protocols of the region. The importance of Leave No Trace on Mount Everest cannot be understated. The mountain's environment is extremely vulnerable to human impact due to its extreme altitude and harsh conditions. Over the years, the increasing number of climbers and expeditions has led to significant environmental degradation, including litter, pollution, and damage to fragile ecosystems. By following the Leave No Trace principles, climbers and trekkers can help protect the mountain's pristine environment, reduce their ecological footprint, and ensure the sustainability of the Everest region for generations to come. It also fosters a culture of responsible tourism, where visitors can experience the grandeur of the mountain without compromising its natural beauty and ecological integrity. It is the collective responsibility of all climbers, guides, and stakeholders involved in mountaineering to uphold these principles and safeguard the unique ecosystem of Mount Everest. Now let's take a look into the two main types of trash found on Everest. The first being climbing gear and equipment. This category includes climbing equipment such as ropes, tents, ice axe, and oxygen cylinders. Climbers often abandon these items on the mountain due to damage, weight restrictions, exhaustion, or the challenge of bringing them back down. The second being non-biodegradable waste. This category consists of various non-biodegradable waste such as plastic bottles, wrappers, food containers, and packaging materials. 
These items are often left behind by climbers during both the ascents and descents. The main causes behind this trash accumulation are mostly due to the following five factors. One, high volume of climbers. With more climbers comes more equipment and waste leading to the accumulation of trash. Two, lack of proper waste disposal facilities. There is a lack of adequate waste management infrastructure on the mountain. The remote and harsh environment makes it challenging to set up proper waste disposal systems, often leaving climbers, apparently, no choice but to leave their trash behind, which I think is absolute crap. But what do I know? I've never been there. Personally, I think even on Mount Everest, there's still no good reason to litter. Unless your actual life is in danger and that's the only thing stopping you from life or death. Three, inadequate regulation and enforcement. Everest is located on the border between Nepal and China. Both countries have different rules and regulations concerning waste management on the mountain. The lack of strict enforcement of existing rules is a big contributor to accumulation. 4. Climate change and glacial melt. The effects of climate change are visible on Everest, with glaciers melting and exposing trash buried under ice for years. As the glaciers recede, more waste becomes visible, exasperating the trash problem. And 5. The lack of awareness and education. Some climbers and trekkers may not be fully aware of the environmental impact of leaving trash behind. Educating individuals about the importance of responsible waste management is crucial to address the issue. The immediate consequences and long-term effects of this trash accumulation can have severe impacts on both the environment and climbers in the region. Some of the immediate consequences include aesthetic and environmental impact. The immediate consequence of trash accumulation on Everest is a visually unappealing landscape. The pristine beauty of the mountain is hidden by the waste left behind by climbers. This trash not only disrupts the natural aesthetics of the environment, but also poses a threat to the local wildlife that may ingest or get entangled in it. Hazards to climbers. Climbers face immediate risks due to the presence of trash on the mountain. Unsecured climbing gear and discarded materials can become dangerous obstacles, causing accidents or injuries to climbers. Sanitary concerns. Trash accumulation can lead to unsanitary conditions, especially around base camps and high-altitude zones. Improper waste disposal can contaminate water sources, potentially causing waterborne illnesses for climbers and locals. The long-term effects include environmental degradation. Over time, trash accumulation can result in the degradation of the fragile mountain ecosystems on Everest. Plastics and other non-biodegradable materials take centuries to decompose, causing long-lasting pollution in the region. Glacial melt contamination. As the trash buried under the ice and snow gets exposed due to glacial melt, pollutants and microplastics can enter water sources. This contamination can have far-reaching consequences for downstream communities that rely on these rivers for drinking water and agriculture. Impact on tourism and local communities. Mount Everest is a significant source of tourism revenue for Nepal and the surrounding region. The presence of trash and environmental degradation can deter potential climbers and trekkers, impacting the livelihoods of local communities that depend on mountaineering tourism. Increased cleanup costs. As trash accumulates year after year, the cost and effort required for cleanup operations increase. Governments, NGOs, and mountaineering associations have to allocate resources to tackle the waste problem, diverting funds from other conservation and development initiatives. With that being said, I want to discuss a few organizations and climbers that are working together to address the environmental challenges posed by the increasing number of climbers and tourists visiting the mountain. First, the Sagarmatha Pollution Control Committee, SPCC. The SPCC is a local organization based in Nepal that has been actively involved in Mount Everest's conservation and waste management. They conduct regular cleanup expeditions, organize awareness campaigns, and implement waste management practices on the mountain. Next, we have the Kambu Passing Lamu Rural Municipality. That was not at all an easy sentence to say. This local governing body has taken initiatives to manage waste in the Kambu region. 
including the Everest Base Camp area. They have introduced waste collection and recycling systems, as well as imposed strict regulations on waste disposal for tourists and climbers. Then we have the Eco Everest Expeditions. Several private expedition companies, such as the Eco Everest Expeditions, have committed to organizing environmentally conscious expeditions. They educate their clients about the leave no trace principles and prioritize proper waste management throughout their journeys. Next is the Cash for Trash initiative. This program offers financial initiatives to Sherpas and climbers who collect and bring down waste from the mountain. By providing monetary rewards, it encourages responsible waste disposal and helps reduce litter on Everest. And last, we have the national and international collaborations. Governments of Nepal and China have been collaborating with international organizations like the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, and the World Wildlife Fund, WWF, to address environment issues on Everest. These collaborations seek to improve waste management, enforce regulations, and protect the fragile mountain ecosystem. These efforts, combined with increased awareness among climbers and tourists, have contributed to a reduction in waste and improved environmental practices on Everest. However, continuous and coordinated efforts are necessary to ensure the sustainable preservation of the mountain. Now, like we discussed before, there are some issues that come along with climbing the mountain. Just like regular climbers, these people going to collect trash and clean up face the same risks. I want to go over a few cleanup specific challenges. One, logistics. We've already discussed the terrain, weather conditions, and altitudes, but due to this, it's more difficult to conduct regular and efficient cleanups. Two, cost. Cleaning Everest is costly. Organizing cleanup expeditions requires significant financial resources to cover transportation, accommodation, food, safety equipment, and skilled manpower. These expenses increase when considering the need to maintain a team at base camp for extended periods during climbing seasons. Funding for cleanup operations typically comes from a mix of government, private, and nonprofit organizations, making it crucial to secure consistent financial support. And three, the seasonal window. As we discussed previously, expeditions of any kind can only be carried out during a specific time frame when the weather is stable and suitable for climbing. This short time frame limits the frequency and duration of cleanup operations and puts immense pressure on ensuring effective waste removal during these periods. To tackle these challenges effectively, collaborative efforts are essential. Regular and systematic cleanup campaigns, waste management facilities at base camps, and stricter regulations on climbing permits and waste disposal are some measures that can help mitigate the environmental impact of Mount Everest and other high-altitude mountains. Let's remember that the natural beauty we cherish is delicate. When we hike, camp, or indulge in outdoor activities, we have a responsibility to leave no trace. So before you embark on your next adventure, take a moment to reflect on your environmental impact. I want to thank you for listening to today's episode of Color Me Green. New episodes come out on Wednesdays, and hopefully each one has something you can take away and learn from. If you want to request a certain topic to discuss, please feel free to message me on the show's Instagram at Color Me Green Podcast, linked in the show notes. If you love today's episode, please make sure to leave a review and let others know what you think of the show. One of the best ways to help change the world is to share this episode with a friend and let them also learn what they can do to live more sustainably. Always remember to reduce, reuse, recycle, and live green.